thanks. It's a great honor to be here. It's a very unusual gig, and it's uh, very nice to see people coming out in the middle of the week. Um, I hope, hope we can keep you entertained. Uh, it's, it's doubly nice to be in, a, in an alchemist cafe um, because I often tell my students that cognitive science, whatever that is, is a lot like alchemy rather than one of the better defined sciences like chemistry. Long before chemistry became a respectable science with well-established methods and procedures that everyone agreed on, it was alchemy and it was a lot more, f well I won't say it was a lot more fun, sorry to all the chemists in the audience, um, <laughs> but they were, there, was a, there was very little agreement. There was a lot of excitement in the air, there were a lot of madcap projects, um, some of which panned out, so we learned a lot about um, substances from alchemy, some of which didn't pan out, we never got the Philosopher's Stone and the Elixir of Eternal Life, but it was an, an exciting time to be involved um, in the business of alchemy, in the business of asking questions in an area where nobody really knew how to ask those questions. So I did say, I, I don't assume that you actually know what cognitive science is, except most of you know it's kind of like psychology. Um, cognitive science for me is first and foremost interdisciplinary. That means it's an attempt to bring experts from a wide variety of fields together and get them to talk to one another because experts from different fields are not very good at talking to each other. They're very good at talking within their field, but not so good at talking to people from the next field over. So philosophers have a hard time talking to chemists, who are not so good at talking to physicists, who might have difficulty talking to psychologists, uh, who don't understand the neuroscientists. Um, so cognitive science is about bringing all these people together to try and elucidate the human condition and figure out what brains, behavior, and mind how these things hook up, what kind of stories we can tell ourselves without making complete fools of ourselves in that area. So just as with alchemy, the area of cognitive science is relatively young, as alchemy was, and the issues, the fundamental issues, are far from settled. And so what I'm just going to do in, the, in, the, in a half an hour or so is, is try and convey to you um, how it, why, it's, why it makes sense to get a lot of experts talking together, what they might talk about, and then some of the, the ways in which I think science itself might be growing as a result of, these, of this enterprise, because the business of getting people to talk together poses problems for, for the whole scientific enterprise, and that makes things really exciting. So the scientific method, most of you will have some idea of what the scientific method is, uh, I'm not going to try and define it, but we all know that central to the scientific method is that um, the stuff we talk about be reasonably objectively verified. So science is about reaching consensus in a non-opinionated fashion. Um, we, want to, we, we use instruments to measure things so that we can refer to those measurements and agree on what was measured. That's objectivity and it's a central part of science and it, it has been as long as the scientific method has uh, held sway. Before that, before the scientific method became generally accepted, of course, you got by in argumentation through bluster and rhetoric and appeal to authority and simply looking knowledgeable. In some ways, not much has changed, but objectivity these days is greatly valued within science. In fact, without objectivity, you might say there is no science. That's wonderful, and this might surprise you, but it's it's actually not that easy to say what it means to be objective, other than to come at questions in ways that garner consensus and that allow us all to agree, irrespective of our individual beliefs. Objectivity has sometimes been defined as being um, the mind's independent set of facts, that which is true irrespective of what anyone believes, what anybody cares about, what anybody thinks, um, so mind independent, that which is true, irrespective of your mind or my mind and your opinion or my opinion. If we can establish a basis for, if we can discuss the issue at hand um, using facts which are mind independent, we can reach consensus and there's no need for us to fight. It's a very, very useful thing. But that leaves one very serious problem and it's a problem that no amount of tinkering can fix because it's a fundamental problem. The subjective is ruled out herewith. Experience, that which it is to be 
to see the world from a first person point of view is necessary, is by definition not objective. And yet, we quite probably care about we quite probably care about the subjective, or we may care about the subjective. If you think we don't, then just imagine the following. You're dead. Now what's the world like? Well, basically, it's pretty much the same world it was before, except that your bubble of experience is gone. And while that may not matter to most of the world, it sure as hell matters to you. There's not much there if you're dead. Each of us lives in this world of experience. Each of us has something that, like present experience which is what it is to be alive, to partake in life, and it matters to us. Um, and the way science is defined, we have great difficulty asking questions about subjective experience. Now, bear in mind, I don't mean experience of the kind you put down in your resume, as was just trotted out something that is in the past. By experience, I mean that which is happening to you right now, that which characterizes your point of view, your way of looking at the world. So, science has come a long way, science is brilliant, science is great, but it's at its best when it's talking about how inert, or things that are not alive, how they move. That's possibly our best science, is, I mean, we can send a piece of metal the size of a school bus up to Mars and get it to land with reasonable accuracy. We're brilliant at that kind of thing. And yet, this wonderful edifice doesn't talk, cannot talk by design, about subjective experience. It turns out to be very difficult to actually talk coherently about subjective experience, and I'm probably going to tie myself up in knots here trying to do so. Um, because language itself is something with which, we, which we use to establish consensus. Language necessarily is something that moves between people, and therefore is only of use if we can agree on something. If we can't agree, we might as well be speaking different languages and not communicating. And yet subjective experience is about that which is peculiarly particularly, specifically, you, right now. So it is, almost by definition, also incommunicable. So here we are trying to F the ineffable. What a mess. Well, I'm not the first one to notice this. Um, back in 1879, uh, the world's first experimental psychology laboratory was opened in Leipzig. And around that time, in the 1870s, the physical sciences were growing by leaps and bounds. I mean, the number of the fundamental discoveries, are every week a new fundamental discovery, fantastic theoretical breakthroughs. There was the belief with science we can, any question that can be well posed, we can pose, and we're clever enough to figure out a way to answer it. And so psychology was born as a way of coming at experience and trying to ask rational, objective questions about experience, about the subjective. And initially, they tried everything in the book. Some of the methods that were established back then are with us today. Some have fallen by the wayside. So the method of introspection has been discredited, sort of just looking inside and trying to figure out what's going on in your experience by looking inside and reporting on it turns out to be notoriously unreliable. And for a while, psychology went down this road in order to prove its scientific credentials, to prove it wasn't just making up stuff and telling pretty stories. They looked very closely at how we behave, and they didn't talk about minds at all. They talked about behavior and observables in an attempt to be very scientific. And while that was very scientific, it also left experience out of the question entirely. Um, and the, but psychology had been born in the, in, the, in the hope of being able to develop the means to talk about experience, to talk about what it is like to be someone at a particular moment. In fact, William James, one of the very first psychologists, he was the guy who gave us that notion of the stream of consciousness, which seems to have fired up so many great literary imaginations. So James Joyce among them, for example. And in stream of consciousness, we get this sense of being inside a person, of the constant flow of experience from a first person point of view.